Hey guys, Stephanie Rigg here, host of the On Attachment podcast, and this is part two of 10 tips to heal your anxious attachment style. So if you haven't checked out part one with the first five tips, definitely go do that before you watch this video. Okay, so let's dive into these tips. The next one is figure out what your needs are and learn to start voicing them. So I cannot tell you the number of times I've heard from anxiously attached clients and students and people in my Instagram community. I don't even know what my needs are. I don't know how to voice my needs. I hear all of this stuff online about you've got to get better at voicing your needs and that's all great, but I don't even know what they are. And then if I start to try and figure out what they are, I then go through this whole additional process of wondering whether I'm being unreasonable, whether, whether I'm asking too much, whether I'm being demanding, whether I'm just being insecure and my needs are just an expression of my insecure attachment patterns. And while I understand all of that, trust me, I've been there. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for you to start taking steps towards not only figuring out what you need, but also taking up the space and using your voice to advocate for yourself and asking. And then what can be the hardest part is actually receiving. Uh, for anxiously attached people, giving is the comfort zone. Receiving is really edgy. And so we can get into this funny pattern where we give and give and give and then feel really resentful and feel like our relationships are imbalanced because we're always the one going out of our way. We're always the one accommodating others. But then the truth is, if we were honest with ourselves, we don't actually know how to receive. If the tables turned very quickly and our partner started doting on us and orbiting around us and paying attention to our every need, we probably wouldn't know what to do with it. So part of your work is learning how to voice needs, learning how to ask for what you need and what you want and taking up space and receiving, spending time in that energy of receivership. So a really good tip for figuring out what your needs are, if this is something that's hard for you, is figure out what most of your complaints are about and then trace them back. So if you often complain about your partner being on their phone while you're together, then you might have a need for more high quality connection and presence. If you often complain about your partner being late, you might have a need for reliability and punctuality and also better communication, right? So if you do struggle with figuring out what your needs are, work back from your complaints and then get really clear on, okay, these are the things I need. These are the things that I value and want in a relationship uh, and then start voicing them. Of course, easier said than done, but that's a big part of the work for you. Okay, the next tip, which is kind of related, is learn how to set and respect boundaries in a healthy way. So. I think we all can agree that anxiously attached people tend not to be very well practiced at boundaries. And while a lot of us think of that in the sense of being a doormat, letting people walk all over us, I'm just going with the flow, never saying no, and that's definitely part of it. I think the lesser known and, and less recognized aspect of this is that anxious folks tend to not be great at respecting other people's boundaries. So you might emotionally dump on people. You might ignore when someone said that they need space and you just bulldoze through it. All of that comes from this boundaryless way of being within yourself and in relationships. So starting to do the work of figuring out what are my boundaries? If you struggle with that, go, what are my limits? What am I okay with? What am I not okay with? What works for me? What doesn't work for me? Um, and really standing in that energy of, okay, I'm going to keep myself safe. I'm going to advocate for myself and I'm going to be curious as to what someone else's limits are, what works for them and what doesn't work for them and find a way that we can build a bridge between where our respective limits and capacities lie. Okay. The next tip is learn tools for healthy conflict and repair. I think it would be fair to say that all insecure attachment style, no matter whether you swing more anxious or avoidant, have some level of conflict aversion. And that comes from the fact that we don't really trust in the ability to have conflict in a safe way. And we probably haven't experienced conflict very safely. So we've got a lot of evidence to back the fact that conflict is scary and dangerous and threatening to our sense of self and to the security of our relationships. And while that's really understandable, the reality is that healthy couples fight um, and the art is really in the repair and hopefully in having conflict in a way that isn't really turbulent and charged, but actually presents you with an opportunity to understand where there are unmet needs in the relationship or how you could be loving each other better, really wanting to know where things could be optimized so that you can be in a strong partnership. And that's what 
healthy conflict becomes a portal to it actually becomes a doorway to greater connection rather than something that inevitably leads to disconnection. So changing the way that you relate to conflict and then learning the tools and the skills to have conflict in a safe way and everything that we've covered up until now will support you in doing this, but that's a really key step in the process of building healthier relationships. Okay. The next tip is get clear on what you want in a partner and a relationship. So of course, if you're already in a relationship, this might feel less relevant to you, but even still, I would say it's incredibly valuable to go through the process of very intentionally setting out what are my values? What do I want to feel in my relationships? What do I want in a partner? What matters to me? Because I cannot tell you how many times I've spoken to people about this. I've asked them that question and they've just given me a really blank look and, you know, becomes apparent that the only criterion we've ever really had for being in relationship with someone is that they want us. And that is not a very good bar to be setting and can lead us to relationships that don't really meet our needs and aren't very fulfilling because we didn't really vet them in the first place. We didn't know what we were looking for other than someone wanting us or choosing us. That was our sole criterion. And so we didn't see all of the ways in which the relationship was maybe not a great fit. So get very clear for yourself. What are my values? What am I looking for in a partner? How do I want my relationship to feel? What are my non-negotiables? What are my deal breakers? And then be ready to stand behind that and trust that, you know, you're not asking for too much, that the things that are important to you are the things that are important to you. And compromising on those in really fundamental ways is probably not going to yield you the kind of relationship that you really desire. Okay. And the last tip that I want to give you is understand what healing actually looks like in this context. So again, I get asked a lot, what does it really mean to heal anxious attachment? Does that mean I won't be anxious anymore? Um, does that mean I'm going to be you know, fully secure and all of this will be behind me and I'll never have to worry about this stuff anymore? Unfortunately not, right? So while a huge part of my work, my own personal journey is a quote unquote healing anxious attachment, it's important to contextualize what that actually means. And the best way I can describe it, the most honest way I can describe it is your anxious parts will still be there, right? We don't get to just eradicate parts of ourselves, particularly parts of us that are designed for self-protection. That can be very persuasive and very deeply entrenched and rightly so. But what can happen is you start to build up all these other parts of you, the parts that are self-assured and self-confident, you have self-trust, you have these new experiences of relationship that tell a different story, that let you really believe that relationships can be safe and supportive and really rewarding in a deep way. And bit by bit, that anxious voice that right now might feel incredibly loud and dominant and overpowering starts to quieten and you're able to observe that anxiety when it comes up and you're able to choose something different. So for me, it's not that I never feel anxious anymore. It's not that I never have those urges or impulses that I know come from you know, the anxious branches of my tree but I'm not at the mercy of them. So I can go, oh, okay, interesting. I'm feeling anxious. What might that be about? I have so many tools and so much practice now at choosing something healthier, at choosing something that's more constructive for my relationships and you know, practicing a more secure way of being. And I don't have so much fear and panic that my anxiety is going to take over because I know that it isn't anymore. It's just not that strong. So I hope that these 10 tips for healing anxious attachment have been really helpful for you. If you're interested to know more, make sure you check out my podcast on attachment. My website has heaps of resources for anxious attachment, and my programs. Um, so I really hope that's helpful and make sure that you like and subscribe if you've liked these videos. Thanks guys.